Overlord Web Novel First Half The Men in the Kingdom Arc Chapter 61 The Capital City of the Kingdom Part 1 Re Estei's Kingdom The Capital Re Estei's There was only one sentence to describe the city that was home to nine million souls. It was an ancient city. That was the most accurate way of describing it. The sentence not only described the city's long history but also hinted that the daily lives of its citizen was utterly simple or the ancient city was unlively at all, forever unchanging. If one wandered through the streets on foot, they would understanding the meaning behind those words. Lining the sides of the road were many ancient households. Those houses lacked in both glamour and freshness. However, it depended on how one looked at things. There were those that appreciate the long history behind those houses. The royal capital was such a city, with many unpaved roads. Once it rained, the road will be muddied. Could not be said that the kingdom was a backwater country. But compared to the empire and the theocracy, there were many aspects that the kingdom was lacking in. The streets could not be considered wide. Still, there were no people that walked in the middle of the street, directly in the path of horse-drawn carriages. Yet, the pedestrian traffic was rather haphazard as people went about their business. On such major roads, the people living in the capital had been long used to such chaotic road conditions. It was normal was pedestrian to meet others front to front. But they instinctively avoided colliding with each other. Seabass was walking in a corner of the city. The road he was walking on was one of those rare paved roads within the capital. Furthermore, the road was rather wide. On his left and right were rows of large and elegant mansions. This area was an important part of the capital. Hence, there were plenty of people here and the area seemed lively. Within the crowd, there were several people who turned their heads and took another look. But Seabass paid them no heed. With a ramrod straight posture, he continued along the road. One step at a time, he had already determined his destination. He moved forward unhesitantly. Since his arrival at the capital, Seabass visited this place several times. Soon his destination was within sight. There was a long wall in front of him with an approximate height of six meters. It was estimated that the wall stretched up to 150 meters to his left and right. Just behind those walls, one might be able to see the pointed roof of a tower. The tower was not considered tall as it reached up to five stories. Yet, the building gave off a feel that it was rather tall as there were no other building within its vicinity that had a similar height. There were several buildings that surrounded the tower. The buildings belonged to an organization where a majority of the magicians within the kingdom were a member of, an organization that specialized in developing new magic, an institute that specialized in educating potential magic casters. The headquarters of the Kingdom Magician Guild. Seabass walked along the wall. Soon he stood in front of the main gate. As the steel gates opened, he noticed the existence of sentries that stood to the left and right sides of the gate. Seabass was not halted by the warriors but was glanced upon as he walked inside the compound. A set of white slanting stairs lay before an ancient chalk white building. The structure was approximately three stories tall with a set of large doors. Of course, the doors were opened, welcoming its daily visitors. Seabass walked through the door. The entrance hall spread out from there. A breeze seemed to come from above the three-story high ceiling, where several magical chandeliers were hanging down. To his right were several sofas, where the visitors could use it for their discussion. To his left was a bulletin board, Several magicians and adventurers were carefully examining the contents of the papers placed there. Deeper inside was a counter, where several young men and women were seated. Every single one of them were wearing the same uniform, a set of long robes with the insignia of the building sewed on the breast. On either side of the counter stood a pair of skinny wooden dolls, of the kind used for sketching. They were the size of actual humans and they had no facial features with golems, in other words, Apparently, they were being used as sentries. The fact that they had not posted any human sentries inside must have been pride on the part of the magician's guild. Seabass paid no mind to them as his shoes pounded out a steady beat as he approached the counter. The young man at the counter noticed Seabass and greeted him with a look. Seabass nodded in return. 
He was a frequent customer here, so both of them were familiar with each other. Smiling gently at Seabass, the man made his usual greetings. Welcome to the Magician's Guild, Seabass Sama. After a few breaths, he continued, How may I help you today? Yes, I'd like to buy a spell scroll. Do you have one in mind? No, may I consult the usual list? Certainly. Ending the slightly long greetings, the young man placed a large book on the counter. The pages of the book were made of high-quality paper that was thin and white as snow, while its cover was made of leather. The overall article was of exquisite construction. The letters upon the cover were imprinted in gold, and the cost of this book alone probably beggared belief. Seabass brought the book over to himself and paged through it. Regretfully, Seabass did not understand the words written upon it. Or rather, it might be better to say that beings from Yggdrasil were unable to comprehend them. Despite the bizarre principle which translated spoken language in this world, written text was not translated. However, Ains had given him a magic item that could solve this problem. Seabass produced a spectacle case from his breast pocket and opened it. A pair of eyeglasses sat within. Its bridge was made of a platinum-like metal, and at a closer look, it seemed to have been inscribed with tiny characters or some kind of textured pattern. The lenses themselves had been ground out of a crystal that resembled blue ice. He brought them to his eyes, and in his blue-tinted field of vision, the previously illegible text was translated. Hmm. He turned the page quickly, but yet with grace. Seabass' hands made one believe that they would continue forever, but they suddenly stopped. He then moved his gaze slightly. Is something the matter? Seabass looked at the girl by the counter and asked in a gentle manner. Ah, it's nothing. The girl blushed and lowered her face. I just thought, you looked very handsome. Is that so? Seabass smiled, and the girl's face flushed even redder. Seabass, the white-haired gentleman, was a person who could mesmerize others on sight. He was good-looking, but the way he carried himself was even more striking. When he walked on the streets, nine out of ten women regardless of age would turn to take a second look at him. It was no wonder that the counter girls found themselves entranced by him, and it was also a common occurrence. Seabass found that understandable, and then turned his eyes back to the tome. After some time, Seabass raised his head. Could you tell me about this spell? Floating board, I believe it is called? Certainly. The young man began his spiel. Floating board is a first-tier spell which creates a translucent floating platform. The size and carrying capacity of the platform varies with the caster's magical power. However, when cast from a scroll, it is limited to a surface of one square meter and can carry a maximum of 50 kilograms. The created board moves behind the caster and can be a maximum of five meters away from him. Since the floating board can only follow behind the caster, it cannot be made to move in front of the, the caster. Should the caster turn around, the board will slowly move to his back. It is primarily a transportation spell and can commonly be seen during earthworks. I see Seabass nodded. Then I'll take a scroll of this spell. Of course. The young man was not surprised by the fact that Seabass had selected a low-demand spell like this. After all, just about all the scrolls Seabass had purchased were for unpopular spells like this. Besides, being able to empty surplus stocks was a godsend for the Magician's Guild. Will one scroll be enough? Yes, please. Thank you. The youth gestured to a man sitting nearby. The man who had been listening on their conversation immediately rose to his feet and opened a door leading into a room behind the counter, which he entered. Scrolls were expensive items and even with guards posted, it would not do to pile them up on the sales area. We shall prepare it immediately, and we would request for your patience. Yeah. Seabass made a nod of understanding, left the counter and stood aside. This was as he the number of people working at the counter was fixed, and he did not want to impose on them. The man returned after five minutes. In his hands was a roll of scroll. Seabass Sama. Seabass took out a small bag from his pocket and returned to the counter. Here it is. Seabass looked at the parchment on the counter. The rolled parchment was sturdy, and its appearance was different from paper that was easily acquired. 
The name of the magic was written in black ink, and Seabass checked that it was the one he wanted. Then he removed his glasses. This is the one. I'll be taking it then. Thank you very much. The man politely lowered his head. This scroll is a first-tier magic scroll and it will cost ten gold coins. Compared to potions it was cheap, but this was as scrolls could only be used by someone who could use the same type of magic. Basically, the price of potions would be higher as anyone could use them. Of course, it was extremely expensive itself. However, to Seabass, no to his master, it was not a large sum. Seabass took out a pouch from his breast pocket. Loosening the mouth, he took out a single coin. A platinum coin. A value of ten gold coins was placed on the man's hands. I have received the payment. The young man did not test the money's authenticity in front of Seabass. Their transactions thus far had earned Seabass that much trust. That old man's really handsome. M.M. Debate broke out among the counter staff once Seabass had left the magician's guild. They were no longer wise women, but love-struck girls who had just met their prince charming. One of the men seated at the counter frowned and his face turned sour, but he kept quiet. On the contrary, one of the other men agreed with the woman's statement. He must have had experience serving some great noble. Every little thing he does is elegant, fro m the way he stands to the way he moves. Everyone seated at the counter could not help but nod. Seabass' posture, face, clothes and his bearing were full of regality. It was at the level where they would agree if someone said that he was a great noble. If he asked me out for tea, I definitely accept. M.M. Me too. Me too. I definitely go too. He looks really learned. You think he's a magic caster too? Beats me, but he might be. The spells Seabass bought had all been recently developed. That implied a broad familiarity with magic. If he had been ordered to buy a scroll, he could have simply asked the counterstaff directly, with no need to browse through the catalog. The fact that Seabass had paged through the tome was a sign that he was making the decisions on what spells to buy. This was not something any ordinary old man could do. In other words, they could surmise that he had received a specialist education in magic that he was a magic caster. And then there's his spectacles. They look expensive. Are they a magic item? I doubt it, they should just be masterwork glasses, right? Made by the dwarves, I think. Hmm, that's amazing, owning a pair of glasses like that. I'd like to see the beautiful girl he came with once. A voice of objection was raised to the man who muttered his thoughts. And that person was too annoying. Yes, Seabass San was quite pitiful. Well, she is a peerless beauty. But for her to be that brash. All right, enough chit-chat. The young man's words cut through their chatter as an adventurer approached the counter. Leaving the magician's guild, Seabass looked up at the sky and pondered about his next destination. The first order he received from his master was to collect information about a country's defenses. Of course, it was extremely difficult to obtain such information. To someone who was not an information-type person like Seabass, it was too difficult to gather information about national secrets. Thus, he collected information that probably existed. Examples of such included the equipment of soldiers and information of adventurers gained from bar owners. It was to investigate the war potential of the country as a whole. The next was to discover to what level had science and magic been developed to, what was possible and impossible, and especially to what level information gathering type magic was developed. In a world with the existence of magic, science was not well developed. Of course, there was definitely research about something that everyone could use, rather than a small group of magic users, but it was currently at the point where no information could be found outside a small circle. And so even he could easily understand Ain's order of gaining magical technology as well. What Seabass was doing was preparation for that. He first had to make acquaintances. The last was to check for the presence of the strong. But this was something that was fine even if left alone. This was as he could not certainly confirm strong existences. In short, he saw the strongest adventurers in the kingdom from afar. But he did not think much of them. No, she alone was different. Seabass recalled one person who could be called strong. Compared to Seabass, she was far weaker, but compared to a maid under him, she could possibly defeat one. 
person of interest. Seabass recalled her face, know her figure, and shook his head. His master had ordered him to investigate her. This was as she could be problematic in future. And thus, Seabass had nothing necessary to do. Now what to do? Seabass sighed, stroked his beard, and began walking. He did not have any fixed destination. Strolling and viewing the city was Seabass's current hobby. He thought of doing such. The sight of him spinning the scroll in his hand and walking was akin a child in a good mood. His legs moved him further away from the center of the capital where the public safety was good. As he turned more corners, the roads became dirtier and stank of something. It was the smell of living trash and dirty mischief. Seabass walked through the thick atmosphere that seemed like it would dirty his clothes. Then he suddenly stopped and looked around. He had entered a small and thin road that seemed to be an alleyway. Hmm. He had mindlessly walked here, but even in an alley without any landmarks, he had a rough sensing of where he was. And so he immediately understood he had walked for a while. To someone of Seabass' physique it was not a large distance but if he walked normally it would take quite some time. It would be rude to the person waiting at home to come back late. Should I go back? In all honesty, he wanted to continue walking, but wasting time on an activity which was half leisure would not be permitted. Seabass turned on his heels and walked through the alleyway. As Seabass forged silently ahead in the darkness, he saw a heavy steel door in front of him about twenty meters away suddenly creak to life as it opened, and light leaked out from within. Seabass stopped and watched silently. The heavy door was opened, and a large bag was left outside. The thing inside was soft and it changed shape upon impact. The door opened on Seabass' side, and he could not see the person hidden by the shadow of the door. However, the person who threw it out and opened the door returned inside immediately and nothing else happened. Seabass raised his eyebrows for an instant, and wondered if he should continue walking or continue in a different direction. After a short hesitation, he continued into the once again silent alleyway. The distance between himself and the bag closed. The mouth was open, but Seabass kept his gaze away from it, and he paid no mind to the bad smell coming from it. He did the same thing for the slightly ajar door. Curiosity killed the cat. It bade him no good to hold interest in the bag or the door that reeked of danger. Seabass decided as such. Seabass stuck to the wall on the opposite side, as if avoiding the bag. And his correctly pounding footsteps stopped. Seabass felt that his pants had caught on something. Seabass wondered if he should look down, faced forward and stopped moving. Seabass wavered and was confused. This was an extremely rare sight. If anyone from Nazareth was here, they would have an expression of extreme surprise. That was the situation Seabass was in. Seabass prepared himself and looked down. He saw what he expected. A small hand grasped Seabass' pants. It came from the half-naked woman sticking out from the bag. The mouth of the bag was fully open, and the top half of the woman was left in the open. The originally healthy blue eyes were dirty and muddled. Her strewn and not long hair was extremely messy, possibly due to a nutrition-poor diet. Her face could not have been said to be beautiful or ugly. It was natural. It was hit and swollen to the point of a ball. In addition, her extremely thin body did not have a drop of life left in it. So he could not determine her age. She could have been an old hag or a young girl. Her skin was like dried wood, and pale red welts were dotted across her skin. She was like a corpse. No, she was not dead. The fact that she was grasping Seabass pants was enough proof of that. However, that was if you considered one to be alive if it was breathing. Such was her existence. Could you please release your hand? There was no reply to Seabass' words. It was obvious that she was not ignoring him. This was as her swollen eyes were open to a crack, and nothing was reflected in her dirty gaze. Could you please release your hand? Seabass repeated himself. If Seabass moved his leg, the fingers that were thinner than branches would fall. This was as those fingers had no more power to them and it was only due to luck that they were still holding on. Yes, fortune would never visit twice. Do you have something you want to say to me? 
when Seabass tried to move. Oi! A threatening, low-pitched voice could be heard. The figure of a man appeared from the door. His thick arms were akimbo. The man had a face full of scars, and he had the atmosphere of someone who worked in violence. Oi, old man, where the fuck did you come from? The man narrowed his eyes and glared at Seabass. He then made an obvious click with his tongue and pointed with his chin. Get lost, old man. You can leave safely if you go now. Seeing that Seabass did not move, the man took a step forward. The sound of the door closing could be heard from behind the man. Oi, you deaf old man? He worked his shoulders and cracked his neck. Then he slowly raised his right hand and clenched it into a fist. He was clearly not afraid to use violence. Chem, Seabass smiled. Coming from an aged gentleman like Seabass, that dignified smile clearly displayed a matchless calm and compassion. Yet, for some reason, the man stepped back as though a ferocious carnivore had appeared before him. Uh, 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 what are you? Shaken by Seabass' smile, the man could not finish the words he was trying to form. He staggered back, without realizing how heavily he was panting. Seabass tucked the scroll marked with the sigil of the magician's guild that he had been holding into his belt. Then he took a single step forward, closing the gap to the man, and extended a hand. The man could not even react to that movement. With a silent whisper, the hand holding on to Seabass' pants fell to the floor of the alley. That seemed to be the signal for Seabass to seize the man by the lapels, and then he easily lifted his body off the ground. Anybody seeing this would surely wonder if this was some kind of joke. Just going by appearances, there was no chance Seabass could take this man in a fight. Be it in terms of age, musculature, his thick arms, height, mass, and the aura of violence around him, the younger man had the advantage. And yet, this distinguished old gentleman was lifting up this heavyweight with one hand. It was a scene that one would believe only if it was the opposite. No, that was not the case. Perhaps an eyewitness would be able to sense the difference between the two of them. While humans had poor instincts, they could still sense a sufficiently great difference between two parties. The difference between Seabass and this man was, it was, the difference between an absolute superior and an utter inferior. The other man who had been lifted completely off the ground flailed his legs and twisted his body. Then, when he thought to take Seabass' hand in both of his own, his eyes filled with fear as he realized something. He finally realized that the man before him was nothing like what his appearance suggested. He also realized that pointless resistance would only serve to anger the monster before him. What is she? As the man began stiffening in fear, that cold voice bored its way into his ears. That voice was as clear and quiet as a softly flowing brook. The sheer contrast with the hand that was easily lifting him up only heightened the man's fear. She, she's a worker in our place. Seabass' grip was loosened, allowing the man to speak. The man raised his voice in fear and panic. At his response, Seabass immediately replied, I asked you what she was, and your answer is that she is a worker? The man wondered if he had said the wrong thing. However, it was the most correct answer he could have given under the present circumstances. The man's eyes were wide in fear, trembling like those of a frightened little animal. It's nothing. It's just that some of my colleagues view humans as objects, so I believe that you too viewed people as objects. If you held that point of view, then you would not consider yourself to have done something wrong. However, you answered that she was a worker. In other words, you considered her a human being. Am I correct? Then, allow me another question. What were you going to do with her? The man thought for a moment. However, one could almost hear the squeezing. Seabass' grip intensified, and the man was briefly breathless. Ugh, hi. Seabass tightened his grip on the man, making it harder for him to breathe, and the man gave off a queer wail. Seabass was sending a message. I won't give you time to think answer now. She, she was sick, so I was taking her to a temple. I do not like being lied to. I... Seabass' grip grew even stronger and the man's face flushed red as a cry leaked out of his throat. However generous he might have been by discounting the fact that he had put someone into a sack for transport, 
The man's actions of dumping said sack into an alley did not feel like he was taking a sick person to the temple for treatment. It was just like disposing of rubbish. Please, stop. The man was having trouble breathing. He thrashed wildly as he realized the mortal danger he was in. Seabass casually blocked the fist headed at his face with one hand. The flailing legs hit Seabass' body and dirted his clothes. But Seabass was as stoic as the mountains. But of course. There was no way that a human's legs could move a mass of steel of several hundred kilos. Even when hit with large legs, Seabass continued calmly and as if he felt no pain. I advise you to tell the truth. Gah. The man was unable to breathe, and Seabass narrowed his eyes at the man's crimson face. He let go of the man just before he had passed out. With a great thump, the man fell to the alley floor. G. Gawork. The main expelled the last dregs of air within himself as a gasped cry, and then greedily drank in the fresh air in big gulps. Seabass continued looking down on him in silence. Then he reached out for his throat again. W. Wait. P. Please wait. While bearing with the fear of understanding what Seabass' outstretched hands meant, the man fell away from them. The Tem that's right. I was taking her to the temple. He was surprisingly strong-willed. Or was he fearful of something else? Seabass thought as such and changed his method of attack. This was the enemy base. The reason why he did not seek help from behind the door was as reinforcements would arrive, or it would be bad if Seabass was delayed. If you're taking her to the temple, then allow me to do so. I will guarantee her safety. The man gulped and his eyes quivered. Then he frantically tried to cobble an excuse together. There's no guarantee you'll really take her there. Then you can come with me. I'm busy now, so I can't go. I'll take her later. The man seemed to have sensed something from Seabass' expression, and he hurriedly continued. She belongs to us by law. If you step in, you'll be breaking the country's laws. And if you dare take her away, that'll be kidnapping. Seabass froze and frowned for the first time. The man had played on his greatest weakness. While his master had said that he could take overt action when the situation called for it, that was only when he was playing the role of a butler caring for his mistress. He should not make a ruckus and quietly gain information. That was his master's wish. If he broke the law, his undercover investigations could possibly be blown. Basically, it was a question of whether this would lead to a large commotion. That said, was it right to just abandon this woman? The man gave off no impression that he had studied the law. However, his words were full of confidence. This meant that he had gained the knowledge from someone who did. Then this was not something he was making up, and the probability that he was prepared for this was high. It would be easy for Seabass to push this through with his strength. However, such acts would tighten a noose around his neck. Of course, he could go tell the law to go eat shit. However, that was the last resort, and only if it infringed on his master's orders. He could not do it for the sake of an unknown woman. The man laughed evilly and poked fun at the hesitating sea bass. Is it okay to drag your master into something terrible in secret? Sea bass raised his eyebrow for the first time. This was as the man felt that he had grasped sea bass' weakness. I don't know which noble you serve. But won't you cause trouble for your master if things get blown up? Do you really think my master could not resolve a matter of this magnitude? Rules exist to be broken by the strong, no? That seemed to have gotten through to the man, and fear flashed across his face for a moment. However, he recovered his confidence almost immediately. Why don't you give it a try, then? Mph. The man made no sign of giving in the Seabass Bluff. So this man and the shield protecting him had strong connections, or that he had confidence the judiciary would not move. Judging that this approach was not effective, Seabass decided to change tack. However, when she herself seeks for help, no matter their business, do you not believe that we should respect her wishes? No, this, the man muttered to himself as he racked his brains. His mask had fallen. Seabass felt relieved at the lack of the man's acting skills and his slow head. Should the man make any attempts to make more lies about the law, Seabass, who had little knowledge of the law, would feel lost. In the end, 
He had no actual knowledge of the law but tried to act smart, so he ended up like this. This was fortunate for Seabass. Seabass looked away from the man and carried the woman's head. Do you want me to rescue you? Seabass asked her. He then brought his ears to the woman's cracked lips. What he heard was a soft breathing sound. No, it was a sound that could have been the echoes of the wind. She did not reply. Seabass gently shook his head and asked again. Do you want me to rescue you? Fortune does not visit twice. Of course, fortune was good luck. Something that happens occasionally. It would be weird for it to occur repeatedly. A broken woman without most of her will grab Seabass pants. She would not get any more of such luck. Seabass' question went unanswered. The man believed so and continued to smile evilly. The environment the woman was in and the hell-like situation. If one knew then this was natural. If it was not, she would not be rotting away and instead try to leave. Yes, her grabbing Seabass pants was nothing more than luck. In her case, her sole piece of good fortune was the fact that Seabass had stepped into this alley and it was now over. Everything else all rested on how much she wanted to survive. That was not luck. Faintly, yes, the woman's lips moved only slightly, but its movements were not natural like breathing. It made one believe that there was intent behind it. Seabass' only response to hearing those words was a big nod. I have no intention of helping those who wish for help like a plant wishing for rain to fall from the sky. However, if you wish to flounder to live, Seabass's hands slowly moved to cover the woman's eyes. Forget your fear and good night. You shall enter under my wings. With such a warm sensation, the woman closed her dirty eyes. The man could not believe it. That was why he tried to speak. Can't be. I didn't hear anything the man wanted to say, but he was frozen in place. Are you calling me a liar? He did not know when Seabass had stood up, but now his razor-sharp gaze transfixed the man. Those were fearsome eyes. Those vicious eyes stopped the man's breathing, as though they possessed the ability to physically crush his heart within his chest. Are you saying I would tell a lie for the likes of you? Anoa, the man's throat croaked, and then he gulped. His eyes moved, fixating on Seabass' arms. He must have remembered the consequences of getting carried away. Then I'll be taking her with me. W. Wait. Seabass faced the man who raised his voice. What is it now? Trying to buy more time? And no. I just need proof. To believe you. Believe me? Proof? Um, money. I... I can't believe that you will bring her to the temple. You might just abduct her. I cannot think of any reason to take and disappear with her though. Does she have such a worth? And not that. But why are you attached to that woman? You can choose any woman you want. Seabass slightly narrowed his eyes. Where was the desire to save this woman born from? He could not understand it. If it was another person from Nazareth, they would avoid trouble and ignore it. They would clap their hands and continue walking. Seabass himself could not explain the workings of his heart. But he decided that now was not the time and replied to the man. Well, it does not matter. How about you follow me to the temple? Doing so would lay any worries to rest. I, I'm a bit busy now. Silence descended. Seabass had no intention of wasting any more time. So basically I should give you money as insurance? Understood. How much? One hundred gold coins. Seabass understood. That this was the man's last hand. If it was a large amount like 100 gold coins, most people would pull out. Seabass could not understand if it was to buy time or is it was something else. However, if he was asking for money, there was definitely a reason for it. 100 gold coins was a kilogram and would be quite large. No one would walk around carrying that much. So the man suggested so as he thought Seabass did not have it and was an impossible request. So Seabass responded immediately. Understood. Seabass took out a bag. The man grew suspicious. It was natural. There was no way 100 gold coins could fit inside such a small bag. I can believe it if they are gems. The gaze of the man then fell on the coins that scattered on the floor. The sparkle of something silver. It was platinum. 
ten of something that had ten times the worth of a gold coin, fell on the floor. Yes, yes, although I believe ten platinum coins are a bit too much for this situation. However, about both of us forget about this now? Uh, and should there be a next time, please ask for money for her treatment. Of course, this is when you come to pick her up. I intend for her to undergo a complete treatment and I promise it will be expensive. And since it is a deposit, I expect it back when you pick her up. Seabass just said that, raised the body of the woman to his chest, and started walking since there was nothing else to do.